morning. So I uh, have taken the last three days off, and vacation is not underrated. Um, I sat on my back porch and uh, got more vitamin D than I have in a long time. Uh, but it may seem kind of odd to take a few days off in the middle of the semester. Um, the reason I took a few days off is because last week, um, around Wednesday or so, uh, I'd been reflecting on the, the sermon text that I was going to preach on um, on Friday. And I've been reflecting on it for a while. And when I say reflecting, things like I'd, I'd read it before bed um, and, and think it through as I was falling to sleep. Um, I'd prayed about it. Um, I'd, I'd written some stuff out. Um, I'd done a fair bit of work. And Wednesday rolled around. And I sat down to actually like type out and, and put the actual um, thoughts on paper and like construct the, the message I wanted to bring. And I just stared at the computer screen. Um, and I spent like an hour and I wrote absolutely nothing, not a single word. Um, my brain just didn't work. And that, has, that doesn't happen to me a lot. Like I've been doing this a long time and I've had busy seasons and not so busy seasons, but that's never happened. So I um, thought that's no big deal. So Wednesday night I went back at it and um, same exact thing. I couldn't do it. So Thursday evening rolls around, and I'm like, all right, I've got four to five hours here that I can just give straight to this. Sat down, nothing. I couldn't do it. Um, so shifted gears a bit, and we did something a little different in chapel last week. We, we read scripture, and um, afterwards I realized I needed to take a little break. I needed to figure out what was going on. Um, came in and, and uh, I was here on Monday, and Craig Bartholomew spoke. I hope, hope most of you guys were here. It was really wonderful. Um, but he talked about busyness, um, and he talked about um, busy, busyness as blasphemy. And it was really very convicting. Um, so I had three days to kind of sit and recalibrate a bit. Uh, I've been reading the book that he, um, he was quoting from, and it's been really um, good. But this is the passage that I've been sitting in for the last few days, the last week or so, um, as I've been reflecting on this. It's a passage that um, uh, has been speaking really directly to me, and I want to share it with you. It's short. Um, it's from Romans chapter 12. Um, and it talks about being conformed to the world and being transformed by Christ. Paul starts in verse 1. And he says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. And we want to take just a moment as we begin to reflect on God's mercy. Um, you are loved by someone who knows everything about you. Just think about that for a second. I'm willing to guess that if I were to ask every single person in this room, is there anyone in this world that knows everything about you? You'd say, well, of course not. Say, is there anybody in this world that if you shared everything about you, they would love you? We're getting into some dangerous territory there. You are loved by someone who knows everything about you. Every thought, every motive, every action knowing all of those things, still wants to claim you as his own and give you his name. That is mercy. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, this mercy that sets you free from slavery, but not free so that you'll be left alone, isolated and autonomous, freedom from bondage and sin into adoption as children. Mercy that makes you family. I urge you, in view of this mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. The, the Greek there is a little bit different than that. I'd like to read it. It's more like this. In view of God's mer mercy, offer your bodies as a sacrifice, living, holy, and pleasing. This doesn't mean that you try to be something that you're not by certain behavioral modifications. In fact, it's just the opposite. What it means is that Paul is calling us to live 
in a way that is consistent with who we actually are. Holy and pleasing to God, you are holy. If the Spirit of God dwells within you, you are holy. Peter talks about it. He says, you're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are God's special possession. You are holy, and you are set apart by him for him. You are also pleasing to God. That can be hard to hear and believe sometimes. God knows you, every part of you, and you are pleasing to him. He takes joy in you. Paul talks about it again in 2 Corinthians. He says, we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. You bring joy to the Father as his child. And then this last piece, offer your bodies as a sacrifice. Offer your whole self as a sacrifice, wholly pleasing, but then living. Most sacrifices, and I'm sure you know, are, are killed when they're offered as the sacrifice. But with Christ, it's different. Instead, Christ became the sacrifice that was killed for us <clears throat> so that we might be alive in him that we might have everlasting life to look to. But there's another sense that Paul's using here when he talks about living. It's a deep theological sense. And it's this, that when you live consistent with who you are that God has made you to be, it is only then that you are truly living. Now hear that for a second. It is only when you are living consistent with who he has redeemed you and created you to be, that you are truly living, that you truly know life. It's very different than existing. This is a life of fullness and abundance that God calls us to and offers us as a free gift in Christ. And then Paul adds, this is your true and proper worship. We talk so much about worship. We talk about different types of worship, different kinds of worship. And if I ask you, what is worship? Well, Paul says, this is what worship is. It is not an activity. Worship is not something that you do. Worship is a sense of being. Worship is living. Living in light of extended mercy and living in sight of grace. That is true and proper worship. It is how you and who you are, not what you do. But then there's also this reality that I think it's important for us to remember. And it's one that doesn't um, really sit well, oftentimes with our sort of uh, individu individualistic Western mindset. Um, you do not belong to you. I am not mine. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you received from God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. Now in 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking specifically about sexual immorality but the grounding principle is this, you are not yours. You've been purchased for a price, but you've been purchased not to be owned, you have been purchased to be freed. And Paul elaborates on what that means. What does it mean to be free? He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't conform but be transformed, conformed to the pattern of this world that you once belonged to. Be transformed by the renewing, the making new of your mind consistent with the world that you're now a citizen of. Don't be conformed to the ways of the world that wants to enslave you, but instead be transformed by the one who bought you and set you free. Now notice this, and this is really cool. The nature of the actions is different. Do not conform 
You are the agent. You are the one doing the action. You are the one conforming. But instead, be transformed. Be transformed is different. You are allowing the action to take place. You are not the agent of the action. The spirit is the agent that acts. You are instead choosing and allowing the action to happen within you. So conforming ourselves to the pattern of the world is really molding ourselves to the heart and the actions of the world. And we can do it in so many different ways. Um, three of them I've been thinking of lately. Um, I mentioned that I took a few days off. Um, and I'll tell you why I couldn't think. Because I had simply gotten too busy. Now, I don't say that by, by mark of um, importance. I had gotten too busy. Um, for a while, my schedule had been 8 to 5, 8 to 5.30, somewhere in there, of meetings all the way through. And with these chunks of blocks of writing in between. So I'd meet, meet, do things, do things, work, 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 and then all of a sudden I, had, I shifted gears to write and reflect and devote and I finally just stopped being able to do it. Now, Craig Bartholomew talked about it. I want to read the quote because the world is busy. And we can be conformed to the patterns of the world. And I found myself conforming to the pattern of busyness. But listen to what Eugene Peterson in the contemplative pastor says about this. Now, he's talking about pastors, but I think we all hear this as believers, right? The word busy is the symptom not of commitment, but of betrayal. It is not devotion, but defection. The adjective busy set as a modifier to pastor should sound to our ears like adulterous to char characterize a husband or embezzling to describe a banker. It's an outrageous scandal, a blasphemous affront. And then he talks about why we allow ourselves to conform to busyness. And he says, basically, it's out of vanity. I want to appear important and significant. What better way than to be busy? I live in a society in which crowded schedules and harassed conditions are evidence of importance, so I develop a crowded schedule and harassed conditions, and when others notice, they acknowledge my significance and my vanity is fed. He also says, I'm lazy because I'm, I'm busy because I'm lazy. He says, I, I indolently let others decide what I will do instead of resolutely deciding myself. By lazily abdicating the essential work of deciding and directing, establishing values and setting goals, other people do it for us. Then we find ourselves frantically at the last minute trying to satisfy a half dozen different demands on our time, none of which is essential to our vocation, to stave off the disaster of disappointing someone. Busyness and the role of the pastor are incompatible, specifically when it comes to praying and listening and as I found, thinking and devoting and preaching. I know you're not pastors, but I also know that you're busy. And I want to ask you to ask yourself and to examine, are you conforming to the patterns of the world in your busyness? Are you so busy that you're not doing what's actually essential? See, you can't be conforming and being transformed at the same time. The two don't work together. Second thing I've been noticing, second pattern of the world that I've been thinking on is the pattern of distraction. We live in a distracted world. We live in a world that has news feeds that have to happen every single day, so things are made up where you can look at, my daughters tell me Reddit's not cool anymore, but I can spend a lot of time on Reddit, and um, I just learned about subreddits, and that's kind of cool. Um, but, right, we're, we're, we're constantly distracting ourselves with whatever the thing may be. I don't mean to pick on phones, but, but really it is the most, we, we have massive computers in our hands all the time, and I'm sure you've experienced it where you're in a restaurant or at a doctor's office and people are all on their phones, distracting their minds, distracting their hearts, 
but I saw it in a way last week that was really interesting. <clears throat> I was in the back of chapel because the front couple of rows were full, and I was back there, and I was listening, but I was also kind of watching you guys. And it was really interesting because um, so many, not so many, a lot of you were distracted. Um, I saw a couple of phones, but it wasn't just phones. It was homework, like straight up people doing homework in chapel and reading books, like just reading books. And it didn't make me angry at all. Like there was no anger. It really just made me kind of sad that we're conforming ourselves to the patterns of the world, that we're not allowing ourselves to be present, present with one another, or in this case, present with what the Lord is hopefully trying to speak through the person up here to us. And that's such a choice that, that people choose to make, like to believe that 20 minutes of homework is more important than hearing what God might be speaking to you is being and choosing to conform to the patterns of the world. Finally, the last thing I've been thinking about is, is the self-focus of the world. The world is a busy, distracted, self-focused place. Um, I don't think we need to um, press into that too far because I think we know how self-focused we are. But what I mean specifically by self-focus is this. It's doing what you want to do without regard for God or others. The hunter behavior is a great example. Um, simply doing what you want to do because it's what you want to do with no regard for what the Lord might want you to do or how it's going to impact other people. Um, the spray painting on campus kind of reminded me of the same thing. Um, simply behavior of what I want to do because I want to do it without any thought of the fact that it's probably going to take like really kind, sweet, loving people 20 to 30 hours to scrub it off because you simply wanted to do it. Um, Self-focus. Self-focus doesn't have to be external and everyone sees it. It's silent as well. We know that it infects every single one of us, but it's not what we're called to do because it's not who we are. Instead, we're called to be transformed. And that may seem impossible to have your minds transformed, the renewing of your minds, but it's not at all impossible. In fact, it is exactly what Paul was talking about before, simply reminding us to actually live in a way that is consistent with who we already are. If I ask you, whose mind do you have? There's a right answer. You have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen to Paul. In, Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, he's talking about it. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Paul reminds us that we have the mind of Christ, and by virtue of having his mind, beginning and being able to know his thoughts, we can know the thoughts of God. We can understand what godly God has freely given us in Christ. We can be transformed. But the truth remains, you can't do both. You can't be in the process of conforming yourself to the world while also expecting to be transformed by Christ. If the things of God, and this may be some of you, if the things of God, the things that Paul's calling us here, sound like foolishness to you, you need to examine your hearts and examine your souls. Because Paul says that the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness. If you need to repent 
and call on Jesus Christ for salvation, do so. The Father's arms are open wide and calling you here, now. Not tomorrow, but today. If this sounds foolish to you, why does it sound foolish? Well, there's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. There's nothing we can do to repay God for the gift of his son. While this transformation that I'm talking about is not the Christian's own doing, but the work of the Holy Spirit, we nevertheless have a real responsibility in the matter. We have to let ourselves be transformed. We have to respond to the leading and the presence of God's Spirit. We have to listen to God's Spirit. We have to heed the prompting of His Spirit in our conscience. We have to have His desire reign more fully than our desire. And then something magical happens. Paul says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. We tend to see God's will as what to do, but again, I think all along it's about who we are to be because who we are to be will inform what it is that we choose to do. If we listen to the Spirit and are transformed by the renewing of our minds, we will begin to see with clarity what God's will is what he desires for us to be so that it will impact what we might do. And then this is just super cool. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. We will be begin to believe, fully, truly, actually believe in our hearts and our minds that what God desires for us is good. That it's pleasing. I will be able to judge it as that's actually more pleasing than anything I've ever desired in my flesh. And our ultimate conclusion will be simply this. It's perfect. It's perfect. That's what he wants for us. Um, I was in this morning, in the shower this morning, thinking about this and an illustration came to mind, and um, it's a little bit base, but I want to share it with you because I think it's important, um, and I think it may sum up kind of this whole thing. You know, sometimes Paul will make these pretty extreme examples when he's giving um, pictures, you know, when he talks about people who are um, the Judaizers who are wanting to circumcise um, believers. He says, I wish they would just go away and emasculate themselves, cut it off. And talks about dogs returning to their vomit. Um, oh, I'm not going to do that. Um, God knows you and loves you. You have his spirit and his mind. And he desires that you live in a way that's consistent with who he's made you to be because that's what it actually means to live. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy to us. We thank you that it is far more magnificent than we can even fathom. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who is far more magnificent than we can imagine. We thank you for the um, unbelievable miracle that we have your spirit dwelling within us and that you've given us your mind. I pray, Father, that by your spirit you would make us desire above all things to be sacrifices to you, holy, perfect, and pleasing, and that that, Lord, uh, might be in our minds what it means to live. Father, might we please um, glorify you in our rejoicing, in our caring for others, in our repentance. Might we raise your name high and sing your praises. We ask these things, Lord, in the powerful name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Amen.